thanks everyone for coming today. So first thing I wanted to do is just review where we are as usual in terms of the uh, calendar. So we did the first part of contracts and mechanism design as kind of an introduction last time. And now we're going to do the second, which is very explicit about another application beyond medieval villages. And we'll definitely have real live data and so on. And then by Thursday, uh, we will get into general equilibrium again, Walrasian worlds and begin to look at trade applications, both in emerging markets and, and then later in the U.S. And say a little bit about the reading list, especially since you might miss this. The paper application that we're going to feature today is this paper uh, with my co-authors on uh, five villages. And uh, we're going to both stress the application using the tools you've already learned in a different context but also some of the techniques. Remember the class is trying to balance both learning tools and how to use them as well as, as the economics. So please don't miss this Karivanov starred article on computing moral hazard programs with lotteries. Because it, and it, I will say a lot about those techniques today, but not enough. So there's two starred articles. I wanted to, again, I have earmarked a few of these from what we did last time. For mechanism design, uh, we did a single period. We worked through the so-called revelation principle. And finally, we got to a two-period problem. And the question, the review question as written here is, now maintaining the lotteries, write down the programming problem for the two periods, dates one and two. I'm not asking you to literally write it down, but could someone volunteer to tell me about the truth-telling constraints at the final date two? Uh, in words, what they look like, and then also in words, <clears throat> what the truth only constraint at date one looks like. I remember the truth telling constraint at the final day two is that uh, no matter what you already announced at the uh, data one, um, based on the theta one two, how what do you announce at the data one, you want to choose uh, you uh, the the true towering bring you the maximized utility. Uh, should I show the function is like the utility at the data two is the u uh, theta two and theta one tuta. And what which multiply the probability function. The probability function was depending on what you are uh, uh, announced in the theta one. And then the whole function will be bigger than any announcement at the theta two. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, and what about at date one? The data one is that you want to, you do not only care about the, um, what you will get at this moment but you also care about the future. I mean, that uh, for data one, the maximize the utility, uh, not maximize, the uh, you're telling the truth that bring you the utility, which is larger than any theta one. Yeah. And what is it assuming about day two, even though it's a date one constraint? Assuming about the day two is that the, the day two do not care about what, yeah, they do not yeah. care. Oh. Yeah, you're very close. So the point of working backwards at day two, we get the truth telling constraint. So the utility is greater for telling the truth and announcing something counterfactual. That's now imposed as part of the solution as a constraint. So working back to date one, it assumes truth telling at date two. So we, we only have to worry about whether to be truthful at date one or, or lie at date one. Um, because whatever they do, truth or lie at date one, they will tell the truth at date two. 
So related to all of this is the message, the announcement at date one. You said something not quite right, but I may have heard it wrong. There's a probability transition function that has to do with the probability of states at day two conditioned on dates at state one. And that never changes. That's just part of the environment. What, what changes the M tilde one that you mentioned is the message at date one, depending on whether or not they told the truth. Uh, so the last, very last part of this review question asks uh, to describe the way in which past history matters for contemporary outcomes. So the key is that the history matters the probability function, right? Because if you tell telling the, whatever you tell at the data one, that will, that will decide the probability because the probability was conditioning on what you are telling. Yeah, what do you announce? So. No, I don't think I have that lecture open anymore. We'd have to go back and look at it. Uh, no, it's buried back deeper in them. Go back and look at the Markov process. The probability P of theta two conditioned on theta one does never, oh, change. that part never changes. Oh, sorry, I mix it. I, I should say the lottery. I always say the probability, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, lottery. I want to say Got the it. lottery. Yeah, they're both probabilities, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay, good, thank you, that's perfect. Okay, and then relatedly, there's this, question right afterwards, what does the solution to that two period problem look like? Is it full insurance? Is it borrowing and lending? And if it's not either one, what, what is the logic of why we know it can't be either? Well, let me uh, take, good. Yeah. Um, I take a step with this. Um, but yeah, so uh, I remember that we said that the full insurance um, wasn't optimal because if you had full insurance, then it wouldn't be truth telling. Um, and so you would never be able to like reach like that optimal equilibrium there. Um, for the borrowing and lending, I remember we had some kind of argument where we said that the incentive constraints won't bind. Um, and so because those didn't bind, um, it's equivalent to just not having the incentive constraints at all, which means you might as well just do full risk share. But we already showed that we couldn't do that. Um, but I don't think I quite recall why the incentive constraints don't bind in the first place. Well, it's a perfect answer, thank you. And to answer your question, the presumption is somehow, if your income is low, you wanna borrow and you strictly prefer that to lending. So that strict preference is a strict inequality in the constraint and hence not binding. And likewise, if your income is high, you strictly prefer to lend rather than borrow. It's okay? Yep, that makes sense, thanks. Yep, your answer was really good, thank you. Okay, so let's go to maybe one more thing here. I did feel that I was rushing a bit toward the end of the lecture. So I could, I'm happy to take questions rather than going through these. Uh, let's try a couple of them to get the conversation going. I drew a distinction between encryption, hashing, and cryptographic puzzles. Does anyone remember? Um, yeah, I think, I think I know this one. So encryption is where you have some specific key, secret key that's shared between two parties, and then you can use that key to encrypt a message and then decrypt it at the other end. Hashing is some sort of function that's hard that like it changes pretty randomly depending on the input. So it's a short it's a short thing that encap that encapsulates the whole message. And if you change the message, um, it was, it's with you. It's very hard to change the message to keep the same hash. Um, a cryptographic puzzle, I think, is something that's just hard to do, and like it's like known to be hard in some way. And I think homomorphic encryption. I think that's the one where you have some sort of basically what amounts to a linear function. So you just like uh, encrypt something, um, add, add together all the encrypted things, and then you can decrypt the sum, and then you can get the correct, you can get the correct um, decrypted sum without having to know any of the individual components or something like that. Very good, excellent. 
So I would just, just a couple words of comment. The encryption part, it's private and public keys and the private keys are never shared. It's the public key that's shared between the parties. And it- I, I think it, I, I'll talk about this. I, I just described symmetric encryption. Yeah, I thought, yeah, but like, yeah, it's also like private public key. Oh, okay. You're, you have the background for this. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, and hashing is what you said. It's kind of a one-way function. You know what goes in, but you cannot interpret what goes out. And the puzzles are fine. And homomorphic encryption, yeah, it's fine. So thank you, that's great. Um, sounds like you might have known the answers to these things before the class, but that's, I mean, from other work that you're doing, but that's fine. Um, let's see, one last thing. Uh, consensus protocol, is a consensus protocol necessarily incentive compatible? So this is like begging for a discussion of how computer science use the word trust and economics use the word trust. And again, I'm just taking volunteers today. Yeah, so that again, lots of information on those slides. This kind of appeared on one slide and I didn't belabor it. The basic idea in computer science is that most nodes are trustworthy. They're gonna follow the protocol, but a, a handful of nodes or actors are either faulty in the sense that the computer doesn't work well or nefarious in the sense that they're determined to undercut the system. So the basic premise is most nodes are honest in the sense that they're gonna follow the, the, excuse me, the algorithm. In economics, you know, it's a dismal science, we don't trust anybody. So uh, everyone on the other hand can be given incentives. So we assume maximizing utility or profit maximizing behavior. And then we load things up in a way that even though there are secrets like preference shocks or unobserved states and so on, the actors have an incentive to reveal what, they, what, what those states are. So the messages as in mechanism design that we did earlier in the lecture uh, are, are part of the contract. And they're gonna be sent honestly uh, but it's due to the incentive constraints. And without the incentive constraints, we kind of assume everyone's gonna cheat. So it is, it is kind of a philosophical difference. Anyway, that's why in the lecture I put uh, the discussion of Bitcoin and other algorithms in the context of mechanism design to draw this contrast. Okay, so that's the review sheet and let's get to the lecture here. Okay, so today, part two, more on contracts. So the application is going to be financial markets and we're gonna try to figure out what kind of contracts a small business would write with a lender. In particular, what the underlying obstacles to trade are. We're going to want to identify from data using the theory what those obstacles are that limit the ability to go into business or limit the ability to finance the business once you're already in business. So that's the economics part of it. The technique part of it is we're going to do a structural estimation of the model but we will also look at some re reduced form techniques that are data summaries that are consistent with the structural model. Essentially, we use reduced form techniques to identify stylized facts different across different regions. And then we use the theory to try to make sense of what we're seeing. It's kind of an experimental laboratory. And there are gonna be two sources of constraints. So one is for short, a collateral constraint. Agents can borrow, but potentially not much. In order to borrow, they have to post collateral so that the, the amount they can borrow is limited by their wealth. That means low wealth households may not borrow very much and it may not make sense to go into a business at all because they can only operate it at a very small scale. 
or if they do go into business because it's the best alternative notwithstanding, they are not investing very much because of that collateral constraint. Now, when there's a collateral constraint that's binding, the borrowing is a proportion of wealth. So if you're thinking about going across different firms in the cross section, as net worth increases, borrowing would increase for, again, for constrained entrepreneurs. On the other hand, it doesn't necessarily mean that with this collateral constraint, everyone's going to be borrowing. They may have enough wealth to entirely self-finance or they, uh, the borrowing constraint isn't binding in the sense that they don't go up to the limit. They have some wealth, they borrow additional resources, but they could have borrowed more and they don't do it. On the other hand, a different constraint is a moral hazard. Now, moral hazard means that, so funny terminology, it's like you buy an insurance policy uh, that's supposed to pay off if you know your house burns down, but because you're insured, then you don't pay attention and take the appropriate precautionary measures. So, so the house is likely to burn down. For some reason in the insurance industry, this is referred to as moral hazard as if it were quote immoral but again from our sort of dismal science economics point of review it's not immoral per se it's just that it didn't have the right incentives okay and in this moral hazard world effort diligence taking care is not observed so the only way the lend the insurance company or the lender can get the money back is when there's not an adverse event or the firm is successful in making profit. Now that means that poor borrowers who owe a lot of money are, don't have an incentive to work very hard at being diligent because they're gonna pay the bulk of their returns back if they're successful to the bank or to the insurance company. So they don't take care and the probability of failure is high. It's a constraint. Because the probability of failure could be high, especially for low wealth agents, the banks in order to break even on those loans have to charge high interest rates. And in fact, the rate could be so high, would be high enough for the lender to break even, but the borrower is no longer interested because it's just too, too high of a rate. And, uh, and likewise, high rates, they may not want to borrow very much even if they do go into business. Another difference with the collateral constraint is in the moral hazard world, uh, the incentive constraint is always binding. That's a version of what we were just discussing. Full insurance is never optimal because under full insurance, you exert minimal effort. So you don't offer full insurance, but likewise, then effort is lower than it would have been in a full information world. So the incentive constraint to be diligent is always binding. And the way out of that problem, if in a cross-section entrepreneurs have more and more wealth comparing one to the other, then they can self-finance more. And the more you self-finance, the less you have to pay back. So in this case, as wealth goes up, borrowing goes down, that's exactly the opposite from what we got in the limited liability case for constrained entrepreneurs when wealth went up, borrowing went up. So I alluded to these reduced form statistics, we will see again at some point a summary of the data that, that depending on the region that they're in, you we will see either this one result in the cross-section or the other one. And yeah, the goal then is to take the full-blown model and do structural estimates to determine which constraint is binding. It could be one, it could be the other. Actually, technically, it could be both. And I'm going to show you that once we review the tools we already have, depending on the appropriate constraints, it's actually easy to test one versus the other versus multiple. It's relatively easy to do. But we are learning some of those new tools today. That's half of the point of the lecture. So I've made reference to twice, two differences across regions. I think I may have shown you this picture before, but I'm not sure. We certainly looked at the Thai data we looked at the monthly data when we did risk and return in Village Thailand, which was the second application of the risk sharing sections. So anyway, Bangkok's over here. This is central region. 
these yellow provinces were ones that I had surveyed in annual data since 1997. And over here in the east, but they call it the northeast, we have two other provinces that are, these are predominantly rural agricultural. The ones near Bangkok are much more industrialized. And here's a, a map of CSICAT just to show you where the data are coming from. We've got a lot of little villages here, these little dots, as well as parts of the road network. And then the colored circles correspond to, uh, if they're purple, you know, these clusters are where we gather the annual data that we're going to be using today. In the previous lectures, risk and return in village Thailand, we were using the monthly data and those are stars. And if you, you know, look really closely, you'll eventually find a cluster uh, with the stars that correspond to the monthly data. The annual data are spread out, you know, much more. Those stars are up here. They're just not visible. I know these provinces like the back of my hand because I've been there so often. Okay, so again, Thai data, 1997 onwards, almost 3,000 households. They're running their businesses, as you know, livestock, fish, shrimp, farm, and small business like vendors. And we have those two regions of the country. The cool thing is that in 1997, we had the foresight to ask about some of the things that had happened in the last five years. So we have their wealth retrospectively, what it was five years ago before 1997, and also what kind of occupation they were engaged in five years before 1997. So that those are two of the key variables, namely how much wealth did you have in 1992 and what business were you in in 1992? And then did you change your occupation, say going from being a wage earner to going into business over those five-year periods? And again, we're going to find the bottom line is the data on wealth and occupation transitions, as well as the cross-sectional data, is going to favor moral hazard as being the constraint in the wealthier central region. And in the Northeast, it's going to be that limited liability, although frequently both limited liability and moral hazard in combination. So hopefully you're wondering how on earth we could ever figure this all out. Here, by the way, is the picture of increasing wealth and increasing probability of making a transition into business. So the, this line here is upward sloping, the higher the wealth, the higher the, the transition. But, you know, this could, in theory, be a very steep profile or a very flat one. So part of it is estimating the profile suggested by the theory and then comparing it to the actual data. Here's the model. So agents, all these ingredients should be very familiar by now. You've seen them at least twice and maybe more. A household that could run a firm or could just be a wage earner cares about the utility of consumption and effort. So the consumption part is constant relative risk aversion. And the, the degree of risk aversion is gamma. When gamma is zero, this thing is linear. That's risk neutral, so not risk averse at all. As gamma gets higher and higher, you have more and more curvature. And then entering inseparably, linearly, is a disutility of effort. Z being effort, taking care, due diligence, how hard you're working. Again, raised to a power like constant relative risk aversion to a different degree gamma two rather than gamma one, and kappa ha, uh, reflects the utility trade-off between consumption and, and effort. So not to say you need to memorize this, but we can pay attention to the parameters. We got three of them here, gamma one, gamma two, and kappa. So we would like to estimate those. And we will start looking at the model when gamma one is zero, hence risk neutral, and then let them be risk averse and estimate the model Generally, the estimation will use linear programming. You've seen this trade-off between consumption and effort. When we did the lecture on utility and preferences, there was a slide at the very end that had the agent choosing between work and wheat as an output. 
And we actually did that in the right-hand side with respect to consumption and leisure or the left-hand side with respect to consumption and effort. So, that, you know, this is a parametric version of, of those same preferences. Okay, more on the model. Households differ with respect to initial wealth, as I said, call that A for assets. They differ with respect to talent, theta. Some people are better at things than other people, like running a business. And S is the level of schooling, formal education. All are observed by the agents and even by the banks. That's a bit of a stretch, but we are imagining the bank can see wealth and talent and education. We, however, only see what we have in the data, which is wealth and schooling. We do not see talent as modelers, but we can make some assumption about it Namely, it's log linear, talent log theta is log linear in assets and schooling. And we assume that error term is normally distributed with a uh, mean zero and variance of one. Why are we doing this? Well, we want to distinguish the constraint, but the worry is that talented people in the past have been more successful and hence already have higher assets. We, we want to be able to distinguish the asset part, which is wealth, which plays a role in the financing constraints versus talent, which is productivity, which is entering in the production function. Um, if we didn't allow talent to depend on wealth, then we could incorrectly infer that financing constraints are playing a role because higher wealth allows people to do better, but actually it could be playing a role through this third variable, namely talent, that higher wealth means higher talent reflects higher talent, and it's actually higher talent that is the reason some people are in business and operating at a higher scale. So this is kind of a shorthand way to allow things to be correlated and not in incorrectly infer something about causality. Other parts of the model, Q is output, profits. It's a function of effort and capital if you're a firm or wage earners. If you're not a firm, this output can take on two values for simplicity, namely success and failure. So when they're successful in the project, the value of Q is theta. So more talented entrepreneurs have higher output conditioned on being successful. And the other simplification is the failure, which means they have zero output. And you know, if you have zero output, then you're not going to repay a loan and there's no output with which to repay the loan. So this whole branch of Q equals zero becomes simplistic. Anyway, yeah, two extremes here, three really. Talent only enters through success. There's only two values of profitability, success or failure, and failure is, corresponds with zero output. So let's look then at the probability of success the probability of Q is equal to theta, the high one, conditioned on effort and the level of capitalization of the firm. And that's essentially in the numerator, like a Cobb-Douglas function. You know, K is capital, Z is effort to the power is alpha and one minus alpha, a function you've seen before. Now, why is it being divided by something? Well, this thing, whole thing, is supposed to be a probability. Probability of success is a number between zero and one. Okay, so if K and Z were zero, the numerator is zero, zero divided by one is zero. So that's the left end point. And likewise, if K and Z are getting really, really big, and there's no natural bound here yet, then this numerator is getting really big, but so is the same term in the denominator. So this whole term is going to one because the numerator and denominator are getting very, very similar. So this P function is a probability between zero and one, no matter what K and Z are put into the, to the firm. Output is always going to be observed in the models that follow. The issue is gonna be whether this effort Z is observed or not, and whether K is restricted by the collateral constraint, and I will show you that in a minute. 
And finally, the other branch, not to lose sight of it, they could choose not to be a firm, in which case k is equal to zero. And when k is equal to zero, the firm is not capitalized and effectively the household is a wage earner. So earnings in the wage sector are also stochastic and probabilistic. You can work hard to find a job, but that doesn't mean you will find one. The higher effort you devote toward work finding a job, the higher would be the probability of uh, getting the wage. Uh, and again, this is bounded between zero and one. Now, if you're a firm, you may or may not borrow, but if you borrow, there's gonna be an interest rate schedule that determines how much you pay back. And that interest rate schedule is a function of two of the things the lending firm observes, the wealth of the household and the household's talent. And this schedule is going to be such that the banks, although maximizing profits, can at best break even. And I'll show you that constraint in a minute. But I already alluded to it in the sense of moral hazard being a problem because repayment going down and banks having to raise interest rates to cover what otherwise would be losses. To, have a, to get enough from the successful firms to cover the fact that the unsuccessful ones are not paying off the loans. When uh, you're a worker or a firm that is not using all their resources to borrow, you have some residual assets left. They put it in the bank and they earn the riskless rate of return R. So in some respects, there's both borrowing and saving going on here, depending on what occupation you choose and your underlying characteristics. So how are we going to solve this problem? we're going to solve for a constrained optimum. We are going to write down a quote unquote planners problem, which I sometimes refer to the math problem, which is maximizing lambda weighted sums of utilities subject to resource truth telling and liability constraints. Now to state, restate that, we're going to maximize the utility uh, a weighted sum of the utility of borrowers and the utility of the banks. The banks, however, could make profits. So we're just distinguishing, in their case, profits as, as a version of utility. The second thing is, and I didn't reload this picture, if you go back to the lecture where we introduced the notion of Pareto optimality, we had the so-called Pareto frontier, and we decided the points on the frontier would be Pareto optimal, and you could achieve those points by maximizing a particular lambda weighted sum of utilities, or in this case, a particular lambda weighted sum of profits and utility of the borrower. But there is another way to do it, which is to maximize the utility of the borrower subject to a fixed profit level of the bank. It's equivalent normally with these, you know, concave frontiers. Then the next step is, okay, there are many, many banks and they're competing. If one representative bank were to make a profit with respect to the borrowing customers, another bank could step in and undercut the first one and do slightly better. So this competitive process is gonna drive the profits of the bank down to zero. So we're gonna be looking at particular Pareto optimum where the utilities of the borrowers are maximized subject to a zero profit constraint on the part of the lenders. There are other optima we're not going to look at today, although it's going to be clear from the equations how we could have done it more generally. Okay, so this is the utility of the borrower. There are three possible branches. Uh, this is again the risk neutral borrower to get warmed up. Uh, if K is zero, which is a choice, but if the solution is K equals to zero, then in fact, the household is a wage earner, not a firm, deciding on effort, which determines the probability of getting the wage, although it comes at a disutility cost of working, and they put all their wealth in the bank. So that risk-free rate of interest times assets is something they get at the end of the period, the savings account. The second branch is they do go into business, and their capitalization is positive, but it's less than their assets. So they can basically take what's left, assets minus capitalization, and put it in the bank. So these guys also get a return on savings. But part of their wealth, the K part, is stuck into the production function. So the return on that comes from 
the possibility of profits. And you still have this trade-off of probability of success versus the disutility of effort. And then the final branch here is these guys have a K, which is relatively large relative to their assets. So they're, they got to borrow. And this sign here is a bit confusing, but if K is greater than A, then A is less than K. So this term is negative. So naturally they're quote negative paying off the principal and the interest on the loan. And they only pay it off if they're successful. So again, this modified Cobb-Douglas probability expression is entering in there as it does for the probability of success. Okay, so those are the three branches. This is the break-even constraint of the bank, which as I've said in words a couple of times already, this is the risk-free rate. So a bank has basically got to get funds from somewhere, from depositors actually, and <clears throat> they got to break even because of all that competition. So they, they may get a higher return depending on the borrower's wealth and talent, but they only get that back when that borrower is successful. So this is the expected return given the interest rate schedule. And that is driven down to the risk-free rate. So we have this zero profit constraint to impose as part of the solution. So again, to repeat myself, instead of maximizing a lambda weighted sum of utilities, we're going to maximize the utility of the borrower subject to a particular lambda for the bank, a lambda which is associated with making zero profits. And we just impose the zero profit constraint from the get-go. It's also kind of interesting in terms of where we are in the class, because when we first introduced utility maximization, we had these sort of partial equilibrium exercises in which prices and so on were taken as given, although we buried them to see what the household will do. Likewise, when we did the firm, we had input prices as taken as given, and we did some experiments. And here, likewise, we're in quote unquote partial equilibrium in the sense that that wage and the interest rate are given to us. <clears throat> we're not trying to explain them. They're going to be part of the data. On the other hand, we're definitely doing a contracting problem here. And to do it, we have to draw on those tools about Pareto optimality and so on, and how to determine Pareto optimal outcomes via programming problems. So we kind of are drawing on two different segments of the class that we've covered already in this application. Okay, so let's talk about limited liability. So limited liability, let's just jump down here. It's easier here. K that they can use the capitalization of the firm is bounded above by their assets. Actually, it's lambda, some proportionality times assets. So this is referred to as a borrowing constraint. Now, lambda could be greater than one. They may be able to borrow more than their wealth, but it is limited. There's a little bit of a derivation here. I was thinking about it this morning. It's not really all that compelling. You can derive this constraint by saying there's a maximum amount they can invest in the firm. Then you write down the equation for borrowing, which is the difference between capital and assets, and then substitute in that maximum amount for capital and derive this equation. This now has A on both sides of the equation, which you could drop and you get equation six as a result. But I'm perfectly happy if you wanted to start with six, The capital is bounded from above due to a collateral constraint related to wealth. That's the limited liability version. Here's the moral hazard version. In this case, the bank does not see the borrower's effort. So whatever the contract is in terms of that repayment schedule and whatever the level of capitalization that the borrower can manage, the choice of how much to work is done by the borrower alone and cannot be dictated. And it's going to be summarized by a first order condition, which is like a solution to the sub problem, which sub problem, this sub problem here. Okay, so this is the branch where the household S firm is borrowing and its payoff in curly brackets is in part a function of Z. So if you differentiate this function with respect to effort, you know, you're going to get the way that the probability of success is increasing with effort you're going to get a part with a negative sign reflecting the disutility of effort. And this probability of success is also entering into, you know, it's like the winner's curse. 
you win, your profits are successful, but you got to pay off the bank. So the higher you work, the more you repay. So take the derivative of this and you get this first order condition over here, equation seven. So that's the formality of it, that it captures the notion, as I've said, that no matter what contract the firm is entering into, the bank cannot see the borrower's effort, but knows how the borrower is determining it. So, so we get this equation seven as another constraint on the, on the program, if we believe moral hazard is strained. So we did limited liability, we did moral hazard, we could have both, and now I'll show you a very cool picture. So this is utility of a household as a firm, but on the X and Y axis are the inputs, the capital level and the effort level. If we did what we would call first best, meaning that we ignore all the limited liability and moral hazard constraints, then the borrower would maximize these choices of capital and effort, choose them to have maximal utility. And where is the utility, maximal utility? It's in this bullseye over here. So in other lectures, we've talked about bliss points, meaning if you're below bliss, you know, utility is increasing as you move toward, in, or you could go above bliss, and which, which is kind of weird, in which case you want to dump stuff. This is an endogenous bliss point. It's, this came from solving an underlying problem, but we can nevertheless plot the solution this way. And where do they want to be? As close to the bullseye as possible, but not at northeast of it. Okay, so now what are the constraints on the problem? There's this liability constraint, which is capital times lambda. And if that's the constraint in the world, and hence in the program, it just simply says capital cannot be to the right of it, it can be to the left of it or on it. So all these solutions on the vertical line and left of the vertical line correspond to satisfying this capitalization constraint for a given value of lambda, which is listed down here at the bottom of the slide. And where is the maximal solution? At the tangency, right here. That's where the, the slope of these concentric rings goes vertical. Okay, let's do the moral hazard. So ignore limited liability constraint and trace out this guy. I did not know a priori what this constraint was going to look like. But if you plot it in the space of K and, and uh, Z, it looks like this. It's like this parabola. Alex was my student and RA for this project. And Anna and I, former student, were writing this paper. We shared the problem with Alex. And Alex came up with this graph. And Alex became a co-author of the paper and subsequent collaborator in many things. Anyway, I love this graph. So if you want to satisfy the moral hazard constraint, you're going to be on the parabola. And where is the maximal point? It's again a tangency with a concentric circle, and it's right here. So interestingly, if you compare these two points, the limited liability constraint solution and the moral hazard constraint solution, limited liability involves less capital and more effort relative to the moral hazard solution, which kind of makes sense. Because with moral hazard, the problem is inducing effort, not capital. With limited liability, the problem is financing that level of capital and efforts fully observed. Now, it turns out if you have both constraints in this world with risk neutrality, there's nothing to optimize. It's like two lines cross. Actually, technically, it's a vertical line crossing with a parabola, but it completely nails down the solution. So K and Z are at the crossing over here. So what we're doing conceptually then is loading in these parameter values for, in this case, a particular talent level, particular asset level, alpha in the production function, kappa, which is the dish utility of effort, and the powers, lambda, lambda one is zero, et cetera, solving the model and, you know, delineating what happens with these various constraints, one, the other, or both. Okay, so now we're going to generalize this. And in particular, we're going to let there be some risk, or there is already risk, but we're going to let the household be risk averse. So their payoff can depend on Q, which they now care about the dispersion because they're risk averse. So there's a consumption, this profit sharing schedule, 
and we're going to want to solve for these probabilities. This kind of came up in the beginning of class. This pi is a probability number, an endogenous number that reflects the solution to a programming problem. So we're going to want to determine the probability of seeing this quadruple, a particular value of C, particular value of Q, a particular value of effort Z, on a particular capitalization level as a function of observed and unobserved characteristics of the borrower, namely theta, A, and S, talent, assets, and schooling. So again, I don't remember what, what slide it's on, but we will determine the solution by these probabilities. They're lotteries. They will make our program in a, turn it into a linear program. And again, this is a bit of a review, but now in an interesting applied context. Remember, we had discrete values for consumption when we introduced the notion of risk. And we talked about the probability pi of choosing a certain bundle, discrete bundle, C, CS, where S delineated all the possible discrete values of C. So that was one place that we did it. And there's been others, but I don't have it right off the top of my head. So, oh, sorry. In the mechanism design literature from the previous lecture, we did it. We had deterministic programs and programs with the lotteries. So that's the second reason to have the lotteries. And I made the point there that they were linear programs. So this, despite putting in truth-telling constraints, when we have the lotteries, the constraints are linear in the pi. And so is the objective function. So here we're gonna have these moral hazard constraints, et cetera which could turn us into a very nonlinear problem because we have the original ma uh, maximum, the objective function subject to a derivative of part of the maximized function as a constraint and you know, Lord knows what that looks like. But we turn it all into a linear programming problem with these lotteries. Not only that, we're gonna imagine discrete values. So it's not a semi-infinite program, it's a finite discrete linear program and that allows capitalization to be chunky. Maybe you get a machine or you don't, for example, so literally a, a discrete value. That also causes a problem, just the way chunky consumption causes a problem. But never mind, lotteries are the cure all. It, it just always works to turn it into this. So don't pass out. Each of these lines will make sense to you. This is the objective function. It's the utility of the household as a function of consumption and effort. This is expected utility because part of the probability involves consumption and effort, which may potentially be chosen at random according to pi. And then we sum up over all these discrete values of CQZK, summing them up, weighting them by pi. So this whole thing is just expected utility. And in this case, the borrower is risk averse. So we get, we're allowing for that. Now, this constraint is what I call a mother nature constraint. What mother nature is giving us is the technology that maps Z and K along with theta into the probability of success Q. So this P tilde function is given. It's part of the underlying environment. But you might think that in part we're solving for the relationship, the probabilistic relationship between Q, Z, and K because everything looks endogenous up here. So we need to impose another constraint to make sure we respect the mother nature. And if you know a little statistics, this is like the probability of A conditioned on event B times the probability of event B is therefore the probability of the joint event A and B. And on the left-hand side, it's already the joint event A and B. So this is the probability of Q conditioned on Z and K. This is the probability of Z and K because we've integrated out the other objects Z and Q. So this is the probability of QZK. And likewise, the left-hand side is the probability of QZK, where we've somehow integrate out the only other object, the C. So this is a mother nature constraint. Again, it's all linear in the pies. So it, we just code it in to MATLAB. This thing down here is the break-even constraint for the bank. And you can think of it as maybe the bank has to pay out more in consumption than output. I mean, in this case, by the way, when the firm is not successful, the output is zero, but the borrower is risk averse and it's going to view it as a disaster to get zero consumption, maybe even minus infinity utility. 
So typically in the failure branch, consumption is greater than Q. That means the bank, which is like taking all of the Q and giving some of it back in terms of C, is suffering a loss on the consumption part. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, it's like the firm, the household as a firm is surrendering all of its assets, A, to the bank to manage, and only some of it gets used to sell to finance. So the firms kind of make a profit on the right-hand side times the difference the bank got that it didn't give back times the external outside interest rate. So this is a zero break-even constraint with the lotteries. This is moral hazard. It's, it's akin to truth-telling. So what this says is the truth is that not only does the borrower characterize by theta A and S, the borrower contemplates doing the recommended action Z, how much effort is supposed to be applied under the contract, but you can't make the borrower do it. The borrower has to be given incentive to work, especially if this is a high level of Z, but the borrower says, nah, I might not do it. So even though Z was recommended by the bank, the borrower does something else, the borrower does Z prime. Note that Z prime is entering into the utility function here. So he really is gonna do that or is thinking about doing it. And this would be the utility consequence. This stupid thing here, we have to readjust the probabilities because when we impose that mother nature constraint, we embedded the probability of success into the endogenous object we would now be making an error if we did not adjust for the fact that the effort being taken is Z prime rather than Z. <clears throat> you know, and this is derived in one of my papers. Hopefully it's somewhat intuitive that at least one needs to do an adjustment. And finally, this is just says the probabilities all add up to one. Okay, so we're gonna max, the programming problem is to maximize the expected utility of the borrower subject to all these constraints. Mother nature constraints, there's a lot of them. For every Q, Z, and K, this is the break-even constraint. There's only one of them. This is the moral hazard constraint to be obedient rather than shirk. And there's one of these for every K that could be assigned and for every Z and alternative value Z prime. And there's only one of these constraints, 11. So I'm actually sort of enumerating the set of all constraints. You can solve these things for a large number of control variables, pi, like thousands, and you can have hundreds of constraints and it's still solvable in things like Cplex, which is a version of which Garubi is publicly available software. So we did this for Garubi was on the market. So we paid $2,000 to get a hold of Cplex and we solved the linear programming problem. I'm going to call the solution the probability of being an entrepreneur. It's a pretty brute force. Namely, what is the probability the capital level is positive? If it's positive, they must be a firm, the way we compose the problem. If capital were zero, they're a wage earner. So ignoring everything else by summing up over everything else, we only care about capital being positive, and we call that the probability of being a firm. It's still conditioned on talent, assets, and schooling. So we have to solve this problem for all those stratifications in the data. So let me go back again. Is it a moral hazard problem? Is it a limited liability problem? Is it both? Is it neither? So we have the master program here that allows everything. All we have to do is comment out the relevant constraint. If we want to look at the, oh, it should have been written here. If we want to delete the moral hazard constraint, we comment out this thing, equation 10. And there's a limited liability constraint, which somehow I'm not seeing in the notation, but it should have been there and we can comment it out. We could allow both moral hazard and limited liability, or we could have neither. And once you go to all the trouble to code this thing up, it's not hard to do all these different combinations and take it to the data. So how do we go to the data? We compute. So again, I'm not being shy about this because we advertise that numerical methods are important at the beginning of the class. So I do want occasionally to show you how numerical methods can get used. And also I know you guys are a great class. Uh, so I'm not worried that this is necessarily too hard, but it's, it may be the first time that you've seen it, which is kind of cool because you'll learn about maximum likelihood. So what do we do? Let's fix all the parameters, alpha, kappa, all of them, a whole array of them. I have that on the slide coming and solve that programming problem. 
for the stratification of ability, education, and wealth, and say do that for the moral hazard regime. Let's keep moral hazard in mind now. Drop limited liability. Now we want to construct the likelihood function, which is for given parameter values, the model predicts the probability of being a firm for households of this type. The model tells us that, and in the data, we see the number, the fraction of the sample that are firms in that wealth, talent, schooling category. So there may be a bit of a mismatch in the sense that for given parameter values, the probability is low in the model and very high in the data or vice versa. So then logically, oh, well, we can play around with the parameter values. We don't know what they are either. So we vary kappa and alpha and all of those things to make the likelihood to maximize the probability that we would see in the data what is predicted by the model. Maximize the probability we would see in the data, which is a given, but it's predicted by the model. And again, the choice is varying over all possible parameter values. Now, that doesn't mean the likelihood will match exactly. It just means the likelihood is as high as it can possibly be after searching over all parameter values. Here's a bit more of the math of it. The string of parameter values would be risk aversion, work aversion, the weight on disutility in the work part, alpha in the production function, delta 0, 1, 2, which are the weights on theta A, theta, and S, I think, or the other way around, lambda being the limited liability constraint. So we're going to maximize over all these parameters and get something like H of A to be the probability of being a firm conditioned on wealth A. And it should have had schooling in here, but not talent. We had to integrate out over talent. So this, this object comes from the model conditioning on the stratification in the data and a string of parameter values. So when we say maximize the likelihood, L, likelihood, is a function of the parameter values, which we will vary, to maximize what? EI is, in, is a statement about the data. It's zero or one. Household I is either a firm or it isn't in the data. So we count up the number. Every time a household is in the data as a firm, we look at the associated probability of predicting that from the model. Uh, this is a probability. Likewise, logs uh, make it the same function. It's just a monotone function of the probability. And logs are cool because they allow you to write everything as separable instead of multiplicative. Here's the other event. A given household uh, in the data is not a firm. It's a wage earner. So one minus zero is one. So this branch is wage earner. And what's the probability of, of being a wage earner? It's one minus the probability of being a firm. So this is the likelihood function, the log likelihood function, a function of the parameters. And this is what we're, the code is maximized. This is not linear code. This is nonlinear optimization code. But there are many routines out there to do this. And if you don't want to think about maximizing this nonlinear function, you can just evaluate it at you know, thousands of these parameter configurations and pick the max, which actually gets close to the, to the maximum. Okay, so too tiny to read, but conceptually, we have a moral hazard column, a limited liability column, and both constraints column. And what we're doing with various specifications, including this one, estimating talent, is reporting the maximized parameter values. So again, that vector string was gamma one, gamma two, kappa, and so on. And you can see the point estimates for risk aversion, which was gamma one, we're getting a point estimates here of uh, 0.06 or 0.02, so almost risk neutral actually. But in parentheses is a standard error, uh, which is expressed a degree of confidence about the point estimates. So those are the parameter estimates. Now, what do we find? We find at the end of the day, a couple of years of research, that the central region favors moral hazard and likewise, in the cross section, as we increased the wealth uh, going from one household to the next, an increase in wealth is uh, associated with an increase in net saving, which we also measured. So this is consistent with moral hazard in the slide I showed you at the beginning. 
that if it's moral hazard and you have higher wealth, you avoid the damage caused by the moral hazard constraint by self-financing. So you should be saving more as wealth goes up. In the Northeast, the story is different. Being constrained, like below the constraint or at the constraint is uh, not related to borrowing particularly. Now it is true that if you were at a constraint, the liability constraint and wealth went up, then you know they'd all be constrained by definition. But there's a branch of entrepreneurs, depending on talent, like if talent is low, their wealth is more than adequate, so they may not be borrowing at all. And likewise here, we get the opposite, that when wealth goes up for constrained entrepreneurs, borrowing goes up. But again, there's this branch of entrepreneurs that are not necessarily borrowing. So that wording on that bottom bullet point is a bit difficult. So we have succeeded to solve the problem. We've identified the constraints that limit small businesses. Interestingly, the constraints are different in the different regions. In the industrialized area near Bangkok, which are very urban, one of these villages is across the road from a Ford Motor Company plant, for example. It looks like moral hazards, the problem. Out in the Northeast, the problem in which is agrarian, mostly rural, the problem seems to be there's a, a very limited financing constraint, limited liability, and they a lot of the households don't have a lot of wealth, so they, they're either constrained or don't go into business at all. Now, we're not doing a policy thing here, but it would be good for policymakers to know this, because if they want to alleviate the constraints on small businesses, they should direct their policy toward maybe in the Northeast, allowing more assets to qualify as collateral, not just land, but, you know, their motorcycles, which they finally did, and, and other things, putting it in escrow to allow or to have the bank to have a claim on it and allow to increase borrowing. In the central area, it's an information problem. So there, if you're determined to try to solve it, it must be better monitoring. You need better signals of the underlying effort by, well, uh, let's try costly state verification, for example, which is something I talked about last time. Not with respect to verifying output, but with respect to getting reliable signals of the underlying effort of the borrower. Okay, so this is the economic science part of it. We have models, we have data, we're trying to get as close to the data as possible. We're also solving an interesting financing, uh, getting understanding of the financing constraint and thinking about how policy would change depending on what we find out rather than one size fits all. So that's all I have for today. Okay, thank you very much.